This event is hosted by Because Mental Health, which is a youth-led organization that aims to end the mental health stigma and increase education of youth in realms of psychology and neuroscience. Today, we are very grateful and honored to have Duenica Greaves with us today, who is a neuroesthetician. You can say it. Yeah, yeah, you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> Investigating the social cognitive effects of performing arts on audiences and performers. She has achieved her BS, BSc in psychology from City University of London, and she also graduated among the first cohort of students from the MSc Psychology of the Arts, Neuroaesthetics, and Creativity program at Goldsmiths University of London. Without further ado, we'll pass the time to Duenica. Hello everyone, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming to this talk as well. So yes, so this talk will basically be about my um, journey to neuroaesthetics. And obviously if there's anything that, say if you can't hear me or anything's not working, someone just, just say something, because um, then I'll be able to hear, because um, I can't obviously see or, or see the chat or anything like that. So yes, about me right now, as you already heard, I had a wonderful introduction. So right now I'm in my first year of my PhD research at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience for University College London. But before we delve into my actual journey, um, the question is, what is, what is neuroaesthetics? Um, so this is the definition that I've basically taken from the website for neuroaesthetics, because it describes it quite nicely. So it says the main objective of neuroaesthetics is to characterize the neurobiological foundations and evolutionary history of the cognitive and affective processes involved in aesthetic experience, experiences and artistic and other creative activities. Now you might still ask, I, I don't get, I still don't get what that means. So I broke it down. So neurobiological foundations, this is the study of the nervous system and how the brain works. Evolutionary history is the development of life on earth. Cognitive processes is the mental processes involved in knowledge and comprehension. Affective processes is feelings and responses. And aesthetic experiences is when you engage with art and you have an effect, uh, effective response. You engage with something that you find that triggers some kind of emotional um, experience within you as well. And obviously artistic and creative activities, you know that that's like um, performing arts or visual arts and stuff like that. But you know what, maybe you might need me to break it down a little bit more because you might be like, okay, I, I understand these definitions, but what fields do they relate to? What subjects am I studying in school that could relate to neuroaesthetics? So continued, there's a whole bunch. So we've got philosophy, you've got the philosophical aspects. And why is philosophy so important, especially to the sciences, is because we're looking at concepts. And in order to find a concept, a lot of times you need to define a concept. So say, for instance, like art, you might be looking at the philosophy of art. So if you come from a philosophy background, neuroaesthetics is a field that you can also get into as well. Oh, let me go back here. Psychology, which is one of the obvious ones, psychology looking at human behavior. And when we're looking at art and how humans interact with art, that is basically how psychology feeds into neuroaesthetics. And we've got neuroscience, which is actually in the title of neuroaesthetics. And that is because we're now looking at the brain. And as, as I said before, we're looking at the processes that were there and that may have come through our like evolutionary history. We're looking at the processes, the cognitive processes in our brain as well. And what kind of brain areas are active when we're engaging with art, or when we're engaging with things that trigger an emotional response. And not only with, with psychology as well, neuroscience comes in with the kind of techniques. What are the techniques that, we, that we're gonna use to basically find out, find the answers to the questions that we are asking about humans and the interaction with art. Then we have biological theories. So biological theories links to the evolutionary um, side of it. So it's kind of like, what kind of things were in humans a long time ago? that might be evident now and might be the, the answer to why we maybe prefer certain things or why we behave in certain ways or what does art mean and how has that like changed across the ages so you can kind of see how these are all feeding in to each other then we've got aesthetic science 
and now aesthetic science is actually the study of so aesthetics is is a it used to be before focusing on what you find pleasing like why do we like what we like it was a, a hugely on pleasure but now it's also about why don't we like certain things as well and then using scientific techniques specifically psychological maybe neuroscientific techniques to find out why say when we're looking at art piece why do i like uh, maybe visual arts but I don't like uh, maybe performing arts or let's say in visual arts, why do I like visual arts? But I prefer paintings in a gallery compared to graffiti on the street. Like there's studies like that that are out there trying to explain through scientific techniques why we like what we like. And then we've got the arts as well. So maybe you might be coming to neuroesthetics from, from the arts um, direction. So you might come from performing arts, uh, so dance, uh, music, um, drama, acting, film. You might come from uh, visual arts, so photography, um, contemporary art. It's just anything that's in the arts. Neuroesthetics could be a field for you as well. But we're also looking at the creative process. We're looking at what do creative people do? What's happening in their brains when they're being creative? What might trigger someone to be creative? And what does this result in? for the world. So looking at things like that as well, that's embedded into new aesthetics. And then lastly, aesthetic responses, judgments and experiences. So that's just like, as you can see the little picture there, it's just our emotions or our responses to certain things. So all of these things added together is used to create research within new aesthetics. And what is nice is that science can be used as a lens into the arts and the arts can be used into the lens of, of the sciences. So it's a nice feedback loop that's happening between all of these fields. So I've got some book recommendations and I'll put a little note there, university level as well, because there's currently, from my knowledge, um, there's no books that are from like GCSE to A-level type age. But I feel I put these books here because I've read them and they're written quite well and they are quite similar to what you would want transitioning from uh, say like A-level to university level, because it's quite um, basic across like the subjects and stuff like that. And it's just nice to read. So if you want to know a bit more about neuroesthetics or about the research that's happening in, in the field as well, or creativity as well, these are definitely books that you can um, get. So obviously if you want to screenshot the screen or, or anything or ask me again later, I will tell you, but these are really, really good books. So the question is, I showed you a massive field of, of research. So where do I place myself within neuroesthetics? So firstly, I'll look at the arts because the arts is what I liked first. So I liked the arts before I actually liked science and specifically within performing arts, I like dance and I like theater. And I'll tell you more about that when we go through my journey. Um, than psychology. So that's how I came into the sciences. So I came, my experiences of science was literally psychology. So it wasn't biology or chemistry or physics, even if I did do those at, at GCSE level, but then I went and I focused on psychology. And then within psychology now, I'm interested in social cognition. So social psychology and cognitive psychology is what stood out to me. Um, and then I'm interested in audiences and performers because I like being an audience member. I like going to watch uh, theatrical productions or dance um, productions, but also I like to perform myself. So it's basically looking at that through psychological measures. Um, then with the neuroscience, I'm interested in the same things again, like social neuroscience or cognitive ne neuroscience, but this time I'm using brain imaging technology. So it's just about the techniques that I'm basically using. So my journey, <laughs> how did I get to new aesthetics? And what I think is really important to note, and I, I know I wrote this in a blog that is also accompanying this talk, is that it doesn't matter what journey you have, you can get there because there's multiple ways to get to the same field. But I'm giving you insight into my journey I'm just out of interest that maybe there might be somebody out there who might have a similar journey or might want to just see top tips and how to create a journey for yourself. So I start with primary school. So this is why when I was a, a child before a teenager, um, I love theatre, I love creative writing. That's what I love since I was a kid. I was always in the, in the plays that my school used to throw. Um, I used to write, like for English lessons, we'd have to have a, 
like a little assignment and then when you write a page you get like a little chocolate football and stuff like that um so i i used to write like pages not because i was trying to get loads of chocolate footballs but because i genuinely liked creative writing and that's what i realized first so i went to secondary school with that in my mind and i thought okay you know for my gcses i know i want to do drama that's the main thing i love theater and i i know i want to do that but there you develop other things because you learn lots of other subjects as well so then my gcse specifically in terms of my options um i chose drama i chose graphics for citizenship so you can kind of see i've still got that artistic base but the citizenship comes in where i'm now starting to think about people and society and things like that but then I was also a student that was quite good at the uh, at the um, core subjects. So English, maths and science, um, those were pushed because it was really important that you got good grades in those subjects. Um, slightly even more important than the artistic subjects. And it was at that time I thought to myself, I don't like that. <laughs> to me, arts is important because it's, it's in me. That's who I am. I'm an artist. And I understand, though, why science, English and maths is important. But I don't see anything as more important than, than, than anything because, as I showed you in the slides before, everything feeds into each other. So I was a teenager. I was a teenager and I made that realization. At, I think, what, 14, 15, maybe? I made that realization. And then I went to sixth form because I chose to continue in education because, of course, there's other options you could do. You can go into work, you can go into um, apprenticeships and things like that. But I chose to go to sixth form because I knew that I liked studying, I liked learning, and I wanted to go as far as I could go. So then after, when I went to sixth form, my aim was to create a base of things that I like, like I'm very passionate about just studying what you like. Um, I understand it's not easy for everybody because sometimes there's external pressures um, just helping you decide what you want to study and you might choose things that maybe your parents might prefer compared to yourself but lucky for me I was able to choose whatever subjects I liked my parents were really um encouraging towards that so that's where I actually started to do psychology because my secondary school did not have a GCSE psychology um then I did sociology as you saw with the citizenship I was really becoming interested in society and people I stuck with my English so my sixth form had a course that was English language and literature together in the same course because I'm aware you can do it separately as A levels. So I wanted to do it together because um, I like, as you can see, I like just mixing things together. And then I also did a BTEC in acting. So I chose not to do the A level in acting because I didn't really want to do like an exam. Like for me, it was just about I want to develop my acting skills. So a lot of people say to me, you're very young to be thinking this analytically. And I don't expect all teenagers to be thinking like this, but through talks like this that I'm giving, maybe it can show you how you can start to think about what you want to do. And that's if you know what you want to do, because a lot of people genuinely don't know, or you might know and you might change your mind, as we can see here. Um, so then after my, um, my A-levels, I thought, yes, I want to go to uni. Um, but I want to do a theatre and psychology degree. So I wanted to mix drama and psychology get together, or maybe sociology and psycho psychology together, or sociology and drama. Basically, I wanted to do a joint um, degree because in the in the UK, um, you either do like a single degree or a joint degree, because I'm aware in other countries, say like the US, you might have a, a major and then like a minor or something like that. Um, so yeah, in the UK, it's like that. It's like one degree or you do a joint one. But the issue with the joint one that I find out, because I was asking a lot of questions when I went to open days, which is a very good thing to do, is that the modules that they taught me in my second year, they were not accredited by the British Psychological Society. So that's one thing to check. Depending on what you want to be, if you know what you want to be, um, a lot of fields have like societies and associations. It's good to check to see what degrees can lead to your accreditation and future development. So that's what I did. And I found out that, as I said, second year modules were not accredited because I think it was in the second year where they started to merge. But in a single psychology degree in second year, you learn the core modules like um, social psychology, cognitive psychology, biological psychology, statistics and all that kind of stuff. So I made the decision to do the psychology degree by itself. And then I pursued my artistic interests outside of university. Now you can do clubs in university. There's like so many societies. And if there isn't a society that 
you like, you can make one. <laughs> so that that's an option as well. But I like to, because I lived in London and I studied in London as well. I wanted to do other things that were in London. I didn't just want to be in the university. So there's a lot of options, especially like in London for where you want to pursue your extracurricular activities. But as we can see, because we're talking about careers as well today, my first career aim was to be a drama therapist. Um, so this was after, I think when I was younger, I wanted to be like an author or uh, an actress or something like that. But now in terms of like things that I'm working towards um, consciously, I want to be a drama therapist because that was the only way that I knew psychology and the arts came together through therapy or therapeutic practices, I should say. And I was in my, I think that was around sixth form and that was like first year of uni. But in second year of uni with the core modules I was talking about, I then realized, oh, I like cognitive psychology. I like research methods. I like social psychology. I like the idea of being a researcher rather than being in practice. So then my career aim changed and I thought, okay, I want to be a research psychologist. And then it was in my final year of study where I did my final year project. Um, my supervisor was Dr. Beatrice Calvo Marino, who is a neuroscientist that studied the sensory motor system and dance. So she did a lot of research in that and obviously does other research as well, but that was the research that I was introduced to, that was her work that I was first introduced to, and that work inspired my research. So for me, that was the first time I heard about neuroaesthetics. That was the first time I saw, oh, the arts and the sciences could come together for research. And I was like, I like this, I like it a lot. So I did my first research project on the effects of mood induction in emotional recognition of movement stimuli and my last career change was like, okay, I want to be a researcher in neuroaesthetics. So we're going to go into my project a little bit, just so you can kind of see ideas of what you could do as a researcher in um, neuroaesthetics, because of course that title, you're probably reading it thinking, what does that even mean? <laughs> so here's an explanation through pictures. <laughs> so I was looking at ballet dancers and I was looking at non-ballet dancers. And I was basically showing them little dance clips like this um, of ballet dancers just doing just a little movement. And I wanted them to rate on a scale how happy or sad they thought the dance um, was. And then I wanted to see the difference between ballet dancers and non-ballet dancers and see whether the ballet dancers might be better at telling me whether a dance clip is happy or sad because they practice it. They have to watch these clips for their for their practice. So I was using this as a measurement, um, a visual analogical scale, if anyone knows what that is, just from zero to a hundred kind of thing, like what, what do you think? Um, and then here is the twist. But what I was doing was I was doing this thing called mood induction, which is when you, um, I don't want to say the word manipulate, but it's when you can, okay, so you can make the brain have the same activity as if, so say you're smiling, right? I can make the brain think you're smiling. If you hold the pen, say the first image, you hold the pen between your teeth like that, your face is like this, but nothing is actually making you smile. But because your face is like this and the pen is there so you can hold it through the study because it's quite long. It was like a 45 minute study. You have to hold the pen like that. Um, and then basically your brain is now activating the same areas if you're happy. So it's kind of like if I am, so mood induction is basically that you're kind of, um, making people feel an emotion, making the brain think it's feeling an emotion, but it's not actually feeling the emotion. So I wanted to see whether that then affects your rating of a happy and sad dance clip. And then I was using these things called uh, galvanic uh, response electrodes, where you basically put it on your finger like this and it takes the your sweat level. So you can't actually see them yourself, but the electrodes can pick it up. So what's quite nice in, in a psychological research and research that I continue to do is nice when you take more than one measure. So you can kind of see how, how dynamic you can pull things in um, to basically get the results that you want and the kind of equipment that you can use to do that. So we'll continue with my journey. I said that was just a little explanation on the, of the kind of research you can do and how arts and sciences can come together or arts and psychology specifically um, came together for me um, with my journey. Then I finished my um, my undergrad degree 
And it was actually my supervisor. She said to me, I know a good course that you will enjoy because I wanted to pursue my master's and she knew that. So she said, okay, this course is new. So the master's course that I did was a course that literally just started as soon as I finished my bachelor's degree, which was incredible. Um, and it was led by Dr. Guido Orgs and Dr. Rebecca Chamberlain. And obviously I'm putting the researchers' names there in case you want to research their work and see what they do. Because all of the researchers that I've mentioned um, conduct research within neuroaesthetics or art science research. Um, and in that module specifically, that's where I learned now about aesthetics and creativity. That's where I started to build my knowledge about, okay, what is neuroaesthetics? What does that mean? What is creativity research? What does that mean? And then that inspired my project. So now I still wanted to do science art research before I did it in dance, but now I had the opportunity to do that with theater. And for me, as I told you all at the beginning, theater was my, my first love and now I'm back and I can do that. Um, this time I didn't have to do that in the lab. My first study was in the lab. This study was actually in a theater space. So I got to do field research, which is really, really great for, psychological or neuroscience research because you're making your research as realistic as possible so it was really good for me and through that project it was a collaboration my university with another university and that's where I met Professor Antonia Hamilton who is now my supervisor for my PhD and uh, UCL that was the uni that I was um, that I'm now with but at the time that I collaborated with and they were looking at actors and the sense of self and they were using brain imaging devices. So I wrote one here, functional near infrared spectroscopy that you can research if you're interested in brain imaging devices. Um, but that for me was the first time. I learned neuroscience in my undergrad and I learned neuroscience in my masters as well, but that was the first time I thought to myself, I like this brain imaging technology. And this is something I can actually do because beforehand I thought, oh, this is too complicated. I, I can't do this. Like. I knew about it, but I never thought that I would have the skill to do that. But being able to be in a lab space where they were doing it and to have encouraging people around me who are showing me how to do it is really helpful. So that's another that top tip to take in as well. So I'm going to explain my study a little bit just so you can understand what I'm talking about. I was looking at the effects of effects of audience participation on audience engagement in theatrical performances. What is that? <laughs> I was looking at, OK. So there's a performance happening on stage, right? If the audience members go on the stage, but then there's some audience members who remain in their seats and then watching a performance, and this is actually the performance that they were watching. Um, it was a deconstructed version of Midsummer's Night's Dream by a theater company called Flute Theatre, who I'll speak about later. So if they watch this performance and then some of them actually get to go on the stage and do a bit of performance, a bit of games with the actors, does that affect their engagement? Now, will they enjoy it more? Do they feel more connected to the performance? But also there was some science communication that was happening in that performance. So this is a scientist, Dr. Jamie Ward, who you'll see later in one of my slides, who was talking about the research that was happening and stuff like that. So it was a very dynamic performance it wasn't just watching a show there was a lot of things involved in the show so if if, if they were involved in in a performance like this what would their engagement levels be like and to do that i use this like a, imagine an apple watch but this watch can basically um, take your breathing levels like your temperature um your movement so all of that in this little watch device if i use that to collect my data will i be able to see that and then I also use some self-report. So, so questionnaires, basically. I, I gave the audience members questionnaires before and after the show as well. So this is just showing you what, how, how psychology, methodology can feed into research, how the arts can feed into research and stuff like that. So that's what I was doing. So obviously I, would, I wanted to talk about autism as well. And the reason why I'm gonna talk about it here is because the theater company that I was talking about they do a lot of research within autism and well, they've co collaborated with the researchers that I've worked with, Dr. Jamie Ward and, and Professor Antonio Hamilton, to look at how um, 
to look at social cognition, so how autistic people basically socialize and how do their brains process this socializing because there's certain deficits that are in autistic people. And this is specifically working with children. So I thought I would actually show you what an original performance might look like. And then you can see an example of how theater and neurodivergence can actually come together with science as well. But this is just the, the theater and neurodivergence side of that. So hopefully you can, I'll play the video, hopefully you can hear it, but it's just music, no one's talking in this one. I can stop that there and basically the director of flute theater is kelly hunter if you type in flute theater um in your search engines then you'll find them and find out more about what they do um but it's a really incredible thing and i actually got to watch the performances with the children with autism and it was really beautiful to see autistic children who are supposed to have social deficits actually be able to engage in a performance with actors so i think it was really really incredible then next, yeah, next we've got Dr. Jamie Ward now. Actually speaking about this research, I thought I could have said it, but I'll just play the video with Dr. Jamie Ward, hopefully explaining it more better than I could as well on the kind of scientific part. One of the assumptions about autism is the inability of autistic people to be able to synchronize or engage non-verbally with others. But when you watch a flute theatre performance, you can see that there is an engagement between the children and between the actors. So as scientists, we wanted to understand why was it working in flute when all the science seems to indicate that it, it doesn't. So we put sensors on the actors, put sensors on the children, and measured the degree to which that they all move together, their, their synchronicity. What we found was some very interesting things. In one case, there was a little boy who didn't seem to be engaged, didn't seem to be watching or very interested in the performance. But when we looked at the data afterwards, we found a clear synchronization between him and the actors. There was a real spike in, in his movement patterns. It turned out he was moving his hand gently in time to everyone around him. He was synchronizing, just not in an obvious way. We found one other person in that performance who was also synchronizing, and it turned out to be his twin sister. So we're finding these social connections and behaviors in autism that we don't expect to see, and we're seeing it through flute theatre and doing some wearable sensing on top of that. Right. So, yes, so that was Dr. Jamie Wood basically explaining, as I said before, the research that we're doing, the same sensors I was talking about in my study, using those with the children as well, and different like smaller ones, because obviously you don't want to use sensors that the kids will find like irritating because they're autistic children as well. Well, so I'm going to make sure that the studies are catered for them, but it's just an example of how you can combine neurodivergent studies with uh, theatre and with psychology to understand and to also create things for people because research like this goes a very long way. Like it's still going on right now, ongoing studies, just trying to work out what are some of the things that can be used in lessons for autistic children. So it shows you how far research can go and how important it is because the research that we conduct say within neuroaesthetics or within social neuroscience linking to the arts can really change the lives of people as well so the question is what do i do now linking this to careers as well so i already told you i've got the academic um route right now and i'm doing my phd 
at University College London in the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, and I'm continuing to do my research on theatre and social cognition. But also there's people out there who might not want to continue in uni. You might not want to do a PhD. You might not even want to do a master's. That's fine. That is absolutely fine. Um, there's also the industry. And for me, I work for a company called Ballet Black, um, which is a company based in London of international dancers of Black and Asian descent. And they are phenomenal. I would highly recommend type Ballet Black into um, YouTube, um, look at their Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and their website, most importantly. They've got free ballet lessons as well, but it's just a really nice thing of how I can involve myself in companies that are already there. Um, and I do audience research and development. So I've taken the skills that I've learned from uni because I've done like extra modules on marketing and just understanding audiences to actually help companies in the real world. But then also, I mean, you might not, you might not want to do that. Or right now you're studying and you're not ready to work as yet. What else can you do? I also do science communication for a magazine, a science art magazine called Seisma. And I'm a contributing writer and I run an online column called Inside the Mind. So if you Google that, you will find it where I interview um, people who are practitioners, so researchers or artists within science and the arts. So it shows there's a, there's a lot of things you can do. So away from me now, the question is, where can neuroaesthetics, well, I should have wrote, where can it take you? <laughs> but then I wrote it as in, you're asking yourself that question. Where can neuroaesthetics take me? That's what you're asking yourself. But also, if you're not in neuroaesthetics, there's also things that you could think about in general and apply it to the fields that you like. So once again, using the slide that I had before, remember all of these fields that I spoke about. If you research in these, in these fields, and also other fields that I haven't mentioned here, like engineering, Dr. Jamie Ward, who you just saw, was actually an engineer. So he came from theatre, he has a theatrical background, but it is an, uh, is an engineer as well, and links that with neuroscience to look at the arts. So as you can see, there's so many other fields. Be creative with how you think about it. Neuroscience is a very creative field. There's always space for, for a field in there. There's always a link and a connection. And I'm sure that other fields are like that as well. They just have to realise that there's a lot of space for merging fields together for research and for other purposes. So first we'll speak about the obvious, looking at career routes, you've got academia. So that's graduate and postgraduate studies. So you can go, you can do your uh, bachelor's degree, it doesn't have to be in science, you could do a normal bachelor's degree as well. So many bachelor's degrees that you can do. Um, then there's postgraduate studies, so that's like masters, um, eventually doing your PhD, like you don't have to do a master's to get a PhD. I know people that have gone from bachelor's to PhD due to the connections they've done or the type of research that they've done. Maybe there was high demand for that research and you can go straight into a PhD. Your life is yours to create. Everybody's life path is very different. You can be a researcher, so you don't actually have to be in an institution for a long time. You can be like a researcher for like three months or you can just have some research experience um you can also be a teacher so you don't actually have to do any research you can well, not do any research you can do both at the same time if you want but as in if you prefer to be more on the um talking about what other people have done and stuff like that that's good not just in um university because then you see here i've got lecturers for people that might want to teach in university but you could be a teacher primary school teacher secondary school teacher you could be a drama teacher you could be a science teacher you could be whatever you want you can also be a mentor you can help give people advice and bring people up as well. So those are kind of like the academic um, occupations. You've got industry. So work for a non-academic institution. You can see here, I've got like example of the arts industry, but you can go beyond that as well. And so with industry, you use the skills that you have directly in the real world. And the difference between that and academia is because in academia, you might do a study and your study will, you do a study for a long period of time. Say like with me, my PhD is four years. I'll do research for four years and at the end, or even through it, what I get from that research, I can put that into the field. When you're working within industry, it's directly into the field, if that makes sense. So there's like a difference between academia and industry. Science communication. So this is the magazine I said that I write for. I write for the online column. So that's just an example. Social media. You can use Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter, all different social media platforms, TikTok, you can do whatever you want to 
um, talk about science or talk about anything else. But obviously, because I'm talking about science, that's why it looks quite science focused with my talk. But you can apply that to anything. Podcasts, that's a really good way. A lot of people like podcasts. That's a nice way to get some information out there as well. You can use YouTube as well if you're more like a vid like you like videos, you like to be more um physically like demonstrating more things that you can't maybe do in a podcast, you can do that on YouTube. Um, there's magazines, I said like Seismo magazine as an example, but other things um that you can do to communicate something. Practice. So you can create site art. You can create art that's a mixture of science um, and, and art together. And that's any field. Like literally, Seismo magazine has just released a print edition on, um, on basically things re relating to space. So they've linked space and the sciences regarding that. Astrophysics, basically. Yeah. Astrophysics with, with art. So it's, it's very dynamic. You can create art, as I said, that's inspired by science. Or you can be the artist that scientists collaborate with. As you saw, as an example, uh, myself and Dr. Jamie Wood, we have collaborated with Flute Theatre. Flute Theatre are not scientists, they are artists. So you don't have to, you don't might not want to be a scientist at all. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. And you can create art for therapeutic purposes. Um, I've got an example. Uh, yeah, so you can see a lot of examples I said on Seismo of people who just, they create art. And then as a scientist, we're interested in that and we go in and we communicate with these people. Mental health, which is a really, really important topic, obviously for this week and for this talk as well. So you might be really interested in mental health um, practice. So like I was saying before, I wanted to be a drama therapist initially. That might be your goal that you really wanna do. You can be a visual art therapist, dance, drama, music therapist, and maybe so many other types of therapeutic groups that I don't know about. Um, you can do art and mental health research. So you can look at the mental health and well-being of artists. I know someone that's currently doing a PhD um, in this area of research as well. And you can also look at how the arts affects mental health and well-being. Um, kind of Studios is uh, um, founded by somebody that was on the same master's course as me a couple of years after me. And um, I got to speak to them about their work. So Kind of Studios is an example of how you can even mix art and mental health research and practice together. I even read an article the other day about um, the fact that architects are looking at how they can make buildings aesthetically pleasing. As we know, we live in cities that are developing or areas that are developing and kind of using certain like weird and wacky ways of building things or building areas or spaces that might be good for our mental health. That also links with neuroaesthetics as well. So it's, it's very, very broad, the link between mental health, um, art and science. So my advice in a nutshell is stay true to your interests. That's what I did. I like drama, I like dance, I like psychology, I like learning about human behavior. So that is what I did. <laughs> I find it very simple uh, as that in terms of my advice, I would always tell people stay true to yourself, even if what you like doesn't exist. When I was in, um, when I was a teenager, I did not know that neuroaesthetics existed, but I stay true to myself and then lo and behold, a, a new field of research came up and that was perfect for me. So definitely stay true to yourself, but research into your interests as well. And then you'll be able to find if new things have come about or the people that are doing things in your field as well, whether it's like, um, like underground or whether it's mainstream, um, it doesn't matter. Like if, if you're interested in something that's underground and it's not mainstream, not everything has to be mainstream just research into the things that you like. Also note, you can pursue more than one at the same time, or you can choose to do it gradually. Like myself, you saw, I do academia, science communication, um, and industry at the same time. You, you don't have to. Your life is yours to make. You can do it one after the other. Lastly, find academic staff and people that can guide you through, towards the field that you want your career to be in. Surround yourself by the people who can propel you. And that's why, I believe I'm here today because I all my supervisors encouraged me onto the next level. I was around people who are positive, who knew about neuroaesthetics, who knew that mixing science and the arts is possible. And I was able to be to gain a lot of opportunities through that. So in whatever field you're in, make sure you do that as well. And that takes a lot of research, as I said before. 
so that's the end of the talk um i really hope that was helpful um obviously that's my email and that's my twitter as well i try to keep my twitter quite science focus and stuff like that and that's the email for contacting me specifically but i really hope that this talk was helpful so i'm going to stop sharing my screen and yeah thank you very much yeah do you have any questions anything about anything doesn't have to be about the talk but can be about your own careers or like any advice for the record i'm not a um i don't work in a career service so any advice i give is from my own life advice or from things that i've seen from people as well or like directed to the talk that i've basically been in just as a disclaimer but yeah any questions throw them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself um you can put your hand up if you want it's a very open space so i've got a question here i'm going to read it aloud for everybody it says i'm also interested in english literature it's my favorite alongside psychology and i'm wondering if english literature has any relationship with mental health okay so i'm gonna to have to think because obviously i'm not in english literature but i have studied english literature before and i feel like it's about how you angle it in the sense that what is it specifically in English literature that you're interested interested in and how does that link with psychology in a sense that English literature will always link with psychology because English literature is um is an expression say like somebody writing a novel is an expression of whether it's politics in the world whether it's um something that's happening in their life whether it's their just their imagination or something like that and that in itself is human behavior so I I actually um I can't remember his name. I think it's on my shelf. I'm trying to like see from here. Um Paul Armstrong. Here we go. Paul Armstrong. I'm gonna write that in the chat. Who's Professor Paul Armstrong? But has written books on uh how literature. I'm gonna write how and Right, so this is more links with neuroscience, um, psychology-ish, and English literature um, specifically. Really good books. Um, and Paul Armstrong is a researcher who has connected that. So definitely check that out. But I can't give any like exact like, okay, so this links with this and this links with mental health, but there is a link. <laughs> so definitely research people who have done that. Hopefully I've answered your question and given something there. Um, but I, I guess actually now I can think of something as well with mental health and English literature, because, for example, language is very important, especially in psychology. Um, I think you learn that in cognitive psychology and in modules there. I think you, you do uh, lessons like lessons on, on lang English language or not English language, any language, to be honest. And. An example is, for example, how. How does language um transferred in for example a novel how does that maybe reflect the mental health of the person who who maybe wrote it or how does language in a novel affect the mental health of a reader just like that that's a study from the top of my head but i just had to quickly think of that and that shows you how it's very easy to to create studies interested in things like that but i said definitely researched people who have done that before um the second question is I know, oh yeah, what do I research? So what am I actually interested in? Um, so with research specifically, I'm a curious person. I like to ask questions. I love coming up with a hypothesis and doing research on that. So when I say research, what methods do I need to investigate this? Like I, I approach research with like an explorer mindset trial and error mindset never approach research thinking i have to find this specific answer or my research is worthless it's about approaching it with that i have a question how do i tackle that question say for me right now my question is how does theatrical training affect the way that people socialize that's my question so for me throughout my phd it's about how do i find the right methods to answer that question 
and be very like I can predict what the answer to that question is but I'm very open to what my research will show me so that's what I like about research are there any other questions okay we've got one oh I like this okay so what do you think are some misconceptions that people have on neuroscience and neuroaesthetics how do you think studying neuroaesthetics has changed your perspective on different situations in the world and what is my biggest lesson learned from this major okay nice so we've got three questions in one so I'm going to ask them one by one so one misconception about neuroscience um and neuroaesthetics so I'm actually firstly I'm actually quite new to neuroscience in terms of studying it I said I came from psychology and now I'm going into neuroscience um I think one thing is that neuroscience is very it looks quite rigid especially because for me I always saw neuroscience as quite human focused because I came from the psychology route not realizing <laughs> that when people hear neuroscience they think a lot of biological neuroscience they think a lot of um animal uh, brain type studies like rats and, and ferrets and looking at the neural processes on that level related to maybe drug research and all that kind of stuff. Neuroscience is a very big field. It's not just human research, it's um, animal research as well, or like just loads of different areas, as I said, biological, social, cognitive, the same way how with psychology, you can have biological psychology, cognitive psychology, social psychology, developmental psychology. You can have all those words attached to neuroscience as well. A lot of people in neuroscience did not actually know about neuroaesthetics. Um, I've actually showed a lot of people what neuroaesthetics actually is in like, my community. Um, so I think one misconception could be that the field is very narrow, which is not necessarily the case. When people think about how broad the field is, they might think about it as in, oh, yes, it's broad in the sense that there's loads of research you can do on like, say, like animal research or there's loads of research you could do on humans. But when we're actually looking at what type of research that actually is, now you deconstruct it more looking at humans oh now i can look at humans and art and the brain um so i think that's what it is like when i was younger it was kind of like you can't do arts and science at the same time that's not true <laughs> you can so i think one misconception yeah is that fields are very narrow which is not necessarily the case um about neuroaesthetics specifically um what i like about neuroaesthetics is that we're trying to create a healthy space where artists and scientists are, are together in the conversation. It's not scientists going into art spaces and using artists as like, a, like guinea pigs or lab rats, that's not the case. We're trying to have healthy conversations, um, exploring the different sides of science, of the art, should I say actually, from philosophical perspectives, scientific perspectives, etc. So that's another thing. We're trying to create like a healthy space of research. So the next one, how do you think studying neuroaesthetics has changed your perspective of different situations in the world? Ooh, I think, let me think about this one. Um, I think neuroaesthetics has made me realize quite similar to the answer I gave to the first question that a lot of things are interlinked. Like there's so much space for people in the field. There's so much opportunity to merge what you like. You don't have to just do one thing um when you look around say like the world for example when I was talking about I read an article the other day and it was showing how architects can actually use studies in neuroaesthetic to kind of create buildings that can improve people's mental health or positively affect people's mental health now when I walk around the world say if I walk around the city and in London there's always new buildings everywhere and it's kind of like I feel, say I might look at a building and it's really nice and I'm like, okay, I, I feel nice in this space. Or a lot of the new flats or apartments they're building, you know, just the way how they create it. And I think about it and think about how has neuroaesthetics basically um, contributed to how we even shape and design a society. Like I know somebody right now who's doing their PhD um, in uh, somewhere in Europe, basically, about like how we engage with what we see on the street. And I think it's just just so many things like that. Um, what is my biggest lesson learned from this major? So my biggest lesson is stay true to myself. My biggest lesson is very abstract. Stay true to yourself. As I said in, in, my, in my advice, it showed me that life is very full circle and you should never give up on what you find interesting or your dreams and things like that because the world is very big. 
um, there's so many humans in the world and there's so many ideas, which means, as I said before, there's just so much space that like, never let anybody invalidate you or make you feel like you don't belong in a certain space, especially when you've got a lot of sides to you. I said myself, I'm a scientist, but I'm also a creative. Um, and because I'm like merging it, it means that in my head, I don't feel like I'm 100% anything, if that makes sense. You don't need to be. Um, you need to see what you bring to the table and be confident in what you bring to the table. And the fact that you can be a person who can ignite conversations across people or can understand bits and bobs from fields, like never think you need to know everything. That's impossible. Nobody can know everything. <laughs> you know, you don't have to. The misconception is, oh, you have to be a genius to do this. You need to know everything about, say, like neuroscience, linking to the first question. Like, I need to know everything before I go and do a PhD in neuroscience no <laughs> i can't even name like half of the brain regions within the prefrontal cortex or like you know i i can't i can't do that but you can learn to do that you can learn to develop your skills like life is a learning process you're not supposed to know everything one time as i said it's very impossible so don't be hard on yourself i think that's like one of the biggest lessons that i've learned going through academia so i think i have a question actually is anyone actually interested in neuroaesthetics or science art research um, in general? Like, if you're not, that's completely fine, but just out of interest, just to know, like, is anyone coming up from the younger generation that's actually interested in these fields? And also, I guess it's good to know that um, research like this is not just in London. A lot of this research is actually happening in, um, I think like, like Germany, like a lot of those kind of like European countries, like, and that side of Europe, basically, like there's a lot of research there. America, uh, I think Canada has a lot of, I've learned over the past years, like it's, it's in a lot of countries. Ah, yeah, new, exactly. With new aesthetics is, is that when people find out, they're like, oh, like there's a lot of people who like science, art stuff together, but they don't actually know that new aesthetics is even a word. <laughs> and that's why I try very hard to create contents like, um, Oh, you can check my website it's literally just my name <laughs> literally um and i write blog posts or just things to i've got creative stuff on there as well but i just write blog posts and things just to deconstruct it break things down because a lot of people don't know and then they realize oh like this is i'm interested in this and it helps give you direction so and even if it's not something that you do as a career maybe you might have a friend who might mention something and now you know something about neuroaesthetics, you don't know who you might help through having a conversation or just knowing that research that this exists because everything that we find out in life, we don't actually have to do. It's just extra knowledge that maybe we can use to help somebody else. But yeah, I don't have any more questions um, at the moment. Um, I think we'll wait for maybe another 20 seconds and then we'll end it there if there's no more questions yeah that's fine and obviously thank you everybody who did like ask a question as well and obviously everyone that didn't thank you for coming still as well like thank you i hope you're like thinking about something hopefully this is like it's by some thought and as i said if you're not in neuroaesthetics and you're in another field think about how you can like apply the same principle to yourself. Like you might be, as I said, in engineering, um, stay true to your interest, stay true to what you like. Say if you don't like the arts at all, that's, that's fine. <laughs> but see how everything can link. And also just know, as I said, down the line of your life, you can change your interest. That's fine as well. So, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, we're going to end here then. Thank you for um, attending, all of you. And thank you for Duenica for spending time with us today. Um, and if you want to reach out to us, you can always DM us on Instagram. And you also have Duenica's social in case you want to reach out to her too. So yeah, um, we hope that you have a great rest of the day. And we look forward to seeing you in future events. Bye, everyone. Thank you.